We're so glad you're here. You have made it to the right place. This is uh, this is TechSoup inviting you to a virtual briefing about democratizing access to data and incorporating local knowledge. We are so excited for this webinar on data commons uh, and, to, and to share with you today. Please continue to input into the chat where you're joining us from. We're so glad that you're here. Also, if you're able to turn on your camera, that would be fantastic. We love seeing your faces. A couple of housekeeping notes. Uh, please keep your mute microphone muted when you're not talking. Again, we love to see your face. Uh, we know that's not possible for everybody, but um, it always helps. And then use the chat to participate. We would love to hear from you in the chat as much as possible. Um, we're tracking that and we'll answer as much as we can. I wanted to note that closed captioning is available. So turn on with the closed caption button located in your Zoom menu. And just to note that this session will be recorded. Um, and this is the first of two. There's another session tomorrow at the exact same time. Um, and that session uh, is a little bit more focused on the application with food security organizations so that organizations can understand how that um, can really be hugely beneficial. So we encourage you to come to that one as well. Um, and we see this as the beginning of a conversation. So I wanted to now turn it over to Marnie Webb, our Chief Community Impact Officer at TechSoup. Just go ahead, Marnie. Hi, everyone. It's great to see you all and uh, virtually. And it is, as Lizzie said, it's wonderful to see all the places that you're uh, calling him from. I am Marty Webb, as Lizzie said, I'm the Chief Community Impact Officer for TechSoup. I'm also the CEO of our product development division, Caravan Studios. Um, and I am here with some wonderful panelists. We're going to spend today talking about how public, how civil society organizations can access, use, and contribute to public data, how they can use that data to tell stories, how they can use that data to illuminate um, issues within their community, and also how they can see the places where data is not, you know, the dark spots in, in the data that, that we need to go in and maybe do some data collection and some work so that we can help understand what's going on. The um, object of this work is uh, a Google project, a Google initiative called Data Commons. We have been funded by google.org to do this. And I'll go through in a little bit and describe uh, um, how the product works and what it is and give a little bit more detail there. But before I go any further, I wanted to give my uh, co-panelists an opportunity to introduce themselves. And Oya BC, maybe we'll, we'll start with you. Just say a little bit about who you are and the organization that you represent. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, I am OEBC and um, I work with the Nigeria Network of NGOs. The Nigeria Network of NGOs is a membership-based organization and, uh, you know, with members spread across the 36 states of the Federation. So good to be here. Welcome. Uh, Ramina. Hi, Marnie. Good morning, everyone. Um, I am Ramina Farias. I'm Research Director of SEMEFI, which is an a membership organization also uh, in Mexico, based in Mexico City. Wonderful, and, and your colleague Julio is here with us. Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, I'm, I am the researcher analyst. The, uh, I'm glad to be here. Thank you for the, the invitation. Uh, I'm glad being here with Romina, with OUVC, with Ingrid, and well, I'm I'm, ex I'm excited to start this. Wonderful to have you here. You're a late late addition, which is why your smiling face is is not on there on the the panelist list. We'll we'll fix that in the deck as we send it out, um, so folks know everyone that was talking. Um, and then Ingrid. Hello everyone. My name is Ingrid. I'm from Macaya. I'm from Colombia. I'm working with Macaya today, and we are a social organization that works with innovation, technology, and cooperation here in Colombia and Latin America. Happy to join today in this conversation. 
it's it's a, for me personally, it's wonderful to have all these panelists here. Some of these organizations we've worked with for many years, and some uh, we're, we're new relationships with. Um, but in in this project, we had an opportunity to work together quite closely um, and look at data. And, and I will say, for my part, that I learned so much. I know our team here at TechSoup learn so much in getting to do this, not just the technology part of the project, but the working with the partners part of the project. So thanks for participation and, and thanks for being here today to talk about what we're done, we've done. Um, so uh, our one of our colleagues, Corey Halbert, is uh, staffing the slide. So I will very subtly ask him to move to the next slide now. Thank you. Um, so today's agenda is welcome and introductions. That's what we've been doing. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about what, what Google's Data Commons actually is, and then we're going to dive in, and most of the conversation today is going to be how we use data to tell stories and how we go in and get data and, and organize it and think about it as a tool for not just uncovering a fact, but, but actually helping to provide context for those facts so that we can understand how we change the things that we wish to change. Um, and so with that, we will dive into what is Google's Data Commons. Actually, I'm wrong. We will dive into a little bit more about uh, what is TechSoup. So the TechSoup Global Network is a group of organizations that are working um, with civil society organizations around the world to make sure they have access to the resources that they need to be able to, the technology and digital resources that they need to be able to do their jobs. and. Um, what what those folks that know us, what they're most likely to know us for is um, the global technology marketplace that we run where organizations can come and get donations and discounts on technology products. Some of that happens on our platform. Some of that is happening on the back end when our corporate partners, are, are, such as Box or Slack, may be um, providing a donation or a discount to organizations. Um, th the thing that people may not know as much about that we do is actually work a lot with those organizations on how they manage their digital stack and use it. And for us, data is an increasingly important part of that digital stack, not just the data that the organizations have, but the data that's in the world around them so that they can look at that in combination with their own data and understand what, what change they're aiming for and whether or not they're progressing towards those changes, the change that they want to make. Um, so this project, this project that we're going to be talking about today, fits very much in, into that scheme, right? It fits very much into the space where we're saying, well, it's not just about getting the technology. It's not just about learning the skills. It's about coming together as a community to do these kind of sense-making activities that help us be able to better understand and tell the stories of our communities in ways that resonate and, and are backed by data and driven by data. Um, so if we can go in and jump to the next thing. Now I'm going to talk about what is Google's Data Commons. Um, so um, Google's Data Commons basically allows anyone with an internet connection to be able to access, use, and contribute to public data. If you imagine for just a second what it may be like in your own organization when you get a spreadsheet from one person and it's got a bunch of data in it organized in rows and columns, you get a spreadsheet from another person also organized in rows and columns, and you want to make that into one spreadsheet. Even in your own organization, it's likely that you got to make changes to the two spreadsheets to get them into one that allows you to look at it and make a graph and use both of the both sets of the data. What, what Google's Data Commons has done is taken away the barrier of, of doing that kind of normalization across different data sets. And they've actually put together, and I'm going to talk about the main three elements of it, they've put together a, 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 a system, really, that allows you to be able to interrogate data from a variety of sources, be able to download data, interact with data, and, and actually have a framework for publishing your own data. So the three main elements of Google's Data Commons is first, Google's public data commons. This is what um, this is what you see if you go to datacommons.org. Google has taken data sets from hundreds of sources where sources are like the UN and the World Bank and the European Union 
and you know the Scottish Space Agency. And they've taken these wide variety of data sets and their data engineers have done all the work of being able to combine and join those data sets to be able to normalize them so you can look across them, right? So it's a lot of heavy lifting. And then they've put a, an AI layer, an artificial intelligence layer on top of it, not generative artificial intelligence that makes up answers it gives back to you, but artificial intelligence that takes your question, the question you have about the data, and says, okay, based on the question you're asking, this is this is the data that I think you want to see. And it shows you that data in numbers and graphs with sources so that you can interrogate the data, so that you can change your question if you didn't get your question quite right. What that, what that means is that you don't have to have a data engineer or a data scientist on staff to be able to do, be curious about the data and to be able to put in queries and get responses to it. So it's a big bit of work that has helped jumpstart this particular ecosystem. The second thing that they've done, and this is the part that I am geekily most excited about actually, is provided a framework for publishing data. This is based on an old a standard, an existing web standard called schema.org that lets you talk about what different things what, what different elements are. So you can identify that something is a first name or a last name and, and that it's a street address or what, what kind of data point it is, right? And it's, it's a very robust mechanism for describing what different data points are. And it's, very ex it's a very extensible mechanism. So it can have, it's not domain specific. It can have a lot of different kinds of data in it. And why I think this is so exciting is, is when I said Google's Data Commons allows anybody to be able to access, use, and, and publish data, it's this, the framework for data publishing that allows civil society organizations to not just be consumers of public data, but to be contributors to public data, and so that it can be joined with these other data sets in the same way that Google has worked on with these things. Finally, they have produced a suite of tools that allow you to interact with this data. One is a set of software that, that is data common software that allows organizations to be able to set up their own instances uh, of data commons. Uh, that's what we've done at, at datacommons.techsoup.org. That's our own instance of data com commons. We're curating the data that's in there. We can use the framework for data publishing to add data into that. But also it has tools in it that allow you to embed charts on your website. A little bit harder than embedding a YouTube video, but the same kind of concept. You know, it takes a little bit uh, extra code, but the same thing. It also allows you, and this feels miraculous to me, it allows you to go in and pick the data points that you're interested in and assemble them into a single um, CSV file, a single spreadsheet, even if they came from different sources. That's because of the work that's happened normalizing it. That means that if I want to make charts and manipulate data on, in, my, in the program that I'm most familiar with on my own computer, I can go in and say, I want these different data points and I can download it and then I can work with it versus having to download 20 different full data sets to get at each of those data points. And it comes in with provenance. Um, and, and by that, I mean, you simply know where the data comes from, right? Where each of those data points come from. So that's part of what you get whenever you use the download tool. And you can find that on datacommons.org in Explorer, the download tool is, is one of the options there. The, the key thing um, behind all of these things is that you can take data sets and you can easily join them uh, across the internet so that you can, you can analyze different pieces of data together with, again, out having to do all the data engineering work to normalize it. What is required is that to, to participate in that way is using the set of standards that have been made available. It's not about using actually the exact tools. It's more about the, the schema. That's, that's what allows it to be joined in these kinds of ways. Um, I think if you just jump to the next slide. So just um, quickly, Google's public data commons is that bottom layer there. That's where they've done the work at ingesting it. Other people can set up their own data commons as we've done with the TechSoup data commons that allows us to pull from data 
in the Google public data commons, but also add our own data and data sets to it. And then you can continue to grow that across other data commons instances. And the combination of the tooling, the APIs, and the schemas allow people to join data across those in instances. So you end up with like a hyperlinked web of data, you, you know, not just of web pages, but it's data that you can interrogate and manipulate and put together in a variety of ways. Um, and so, and Data Commons has, as I said, made a bunch of tools that make it easy for you to explore this. They have a statistical variable explorer. This quite simply lets you look at the vast number of the vast amount of data they have in there and say, OK, I want to see data about demographics. And then you can open that up and go through and pick what demographics you want to explore and examine. A place explorer that allows you to dive into the data that's available in a region, in a country. Um, you know, it can go very far down in the United States. It goes all the way down to the census tract level. Um, uh, a map explorer, which actually allows you to do that kind of exploration, but literally against a map so that you're looking at the map and picking out certain sections you want to do, look at more deeply. And then finally, a timeline explorer. The timeline explorer allows you to take the data that you might have looked at in the place explorer or the map explorer and spread it out over time. So I'm not just seeing the number of fires in, in Chile, let's say, um, right now, but I'm able to see how fires have changed over time um, and see that against a, against a, a, well, a timeline explorer, that's what it's called. So that's the best word to use. Um, all of this comes together so that you can explore the data and, and get in and start telling stories with it. And that's the part with, with that little bit of background and, and do feel free to um, drop quest any questions into the chat that you might have. But, um, uh, what we want to do now with that little bit of background on what Data Commons is, is get in and, and show you how, how these three different groups used it to, to accomplish some goals and to share some data and dive into it. And, and OUBC, let's, uh, let's start with you. So much uh, for, for, for that uh, background. And I think for Ross at the Nigerian Network of NGOs, uh, this platform is a good way of democratizing evidence for development. Uh, so you find that we now have data for all of us, like Mary explained, for all of us to bring in data and also to see what already exists. And that was what we did while we were working on thinking around what progress have we made around the Sustainable Development Goals in Nigeria. We had a pool of data from the Data Commons platform, and we started interrogating them, interrogating them for us to be able to evidence the progress, but also to begin to think more as to what may have helped us to get here, what is hindering us, what are the gaps. Uh, so when you look at the page itself, we started looking at the population of the country, then bringing it back down uh, into issues around the health, the issues around maternal mortality. And after we've done all of that, we weren't concluding. We were more or less trying to interrogate what the data was telling us. And it helps us in being able to bring data to critical stakeholders. And for these, it helps also our diplomacy, engaging the SDGs from the point of lens of what has Nigeria done and what progress have we made? Uh, the beauty of this platform is that, you know, the, for the shadow voluntary national reports that we write as civil society organizations, we can now evidence data from civil society, evidence data from private sector, evidence data from the UN system, and also from other organizations that may have pulled, off, uh, pulled up that data for all of us to say, okay, what exactly is happening with education? What is happening with health? What is happening? with population and what is happening with our sustainability and what future does this tell us? What does the present also tell us? And how can we use this information to plan um, for the attainment of the sustainable development goals? Uh, this is one of the best ways for us to ensure uh, that, again, 
that data can be trusted. Uh, I always say that data can be political or technical. The technical side of data is what we now have, where we're using Google's facility to be able to bring everything together in ways that are accessible and also in ways that we can have the right information. Then bringing multilateral data that may have been gone through rigorous processes as well into the poll. Then for us as civil society organizations to then begin to look at that data in ways that provides us evidence and ways that helps us to be able to sit at the table and tell government what is working, what is not working, and not necessarily with emotions, but with what the facts that we're seeing uh, is, uh, is, is telling us. And, and that's what we've done with uh, what you see on your on, on your screen at, at this time. And it's very excellent. It, it got to a time where we were also looking at the gaps in data. And this also speaks to what Mary said around, sometimes the data we are missing and we have to ask ourselves, why is this data missing? How can we get this data such that we can begin to use that also to uh, evidence the progress that we're making towards the SDGs. You would recall that the SDGs itself requires a lot of evidence so that we can show progress and also see where we need to advance or need to accelerate. And that's what we've, we've done with uh, the Nigerian page. Very interesting assignment. Uh, you don't necessarily have to have all of uh, the answers, but what this does to you is helps you to have a mind wide open when you get into the data commons poll. Mind wide open. Of course, you can begin to now start asking questions around the data you are seeing and using that to think through what progress should look like or at the moment what gaps are there and how those can be addressed. Over. I'm, I'm talking, but on mute. Um, you'd think I'd have learned by now. Um, Corey, if you can just um, jump back actually to the screen for just a second. I wanted to point a couple things out and link to the general description of data commons. Um, if, if you have questions for OUBC or, or for us in general, again, feel free to drop them into the Zoom chat. We'll, we'll have a bunch of times for questions at the end. Corey, will you scroll down again? I think it was to the fertility and births section and then pause there for just a minute. One, th these are, this is the timeline explorer that I was talking about. So it allows you to take the data and you can examine it right now, but you can also see it against the timeline. I also want to note a couple of things. One of these, um, this is on uh, datacommons.techsoup.org. So this is the instance of data commons that we put up and worked with. And we're pulling data from Google's public data commons and choosing the visualizations that allow us to it tell the story that OUBC was talking about, right? And getting in to examine the data because the local you know, expertise is what's necessary to understand the context of the data that you're looking at. And I think the distinction OUBC that you made between the technical and political part of data is great. You know, and I might extend that to also say there's a social part of data because it's telling our stories in aggregate, right? As a collection of, of, of people, that are engaging in different ways. So I think this is a great example of being able to pull data out of the data visualization and then be able to provide context and talk about it. And I think if you go, um, yeah, just go ahead and stay there for, rather than change. I also wanna just point out that you'll see that you know where the data is coming from. Both of these have the provenance. Don't You don't need to do it now, Corey, but clicking through on those links will take you back to the source so you can, do some of what OUBC was talking about and say, how much do I trust this data? You can also export the data so that you can get at it and you can investigate it and say what other stories you might find in it than the story that was chosen here. So this is a, a robust tool to expose the data, but then actually allow you to do more and more sophisticated data exploration, you know, relatively easy from, a, from a, a, the same starting place. Um, and uh, I'm just gonna scan to see if we don't have any open questions right now. Again, drop them in and we'll, we'll, we'll have plenty of time for questions at the end. Um, thank you uh, for describing that. And, and Corey, thanks for bringing that back up. Let's go ahead and 
go to uh, Ingrid with, with Micaiah. Thank you, Marnie. Uh, well, uh, first of all, I would like to talk a little bit about Micaiah and tell why we actually in a partnership with TechSoup to talk about uh, telling stories of data. Um, well, uh, first of all, Makai is part of resisting haste capacities for society and developed that through three things, cooperation, technology, and innovation. And we believe that technology actually is a strong platform and tool to get into innovation and cooperation between the civil society organizations in whole Latin America. Um, we see this as an increase of opportunities for the for them to transform and of course um, be a part of the transformation of their surroundings and context. Um, we've worked through through two uh, lines of action. Uh, one of them is, uh, if we go to the next slide, please. Uh, one of them is the technology for the social change. So we bring actually technology closer to individuals and organizations, and we friendly try to um, go into our proven methodologies to explain the, the capabilities, access uh, opportunities and knowledge. And we also uh, improve capacities through our line of mobilization um, and crowdfunding in the, into the national and international resources for social impact through our platform, Noloka. Uh, this is some figures uh, about our social contribution in Latin America and Colombia. We've, work in around 24 departments out of the 36 that we have in Colombia, and we work in the 18 countries in Latin America. Um, so this is a little bit about us uh, to talk about uh, why we have uh, the pleasure to work uh, near TechSoup um, for this, uh, this project in the data commons. Um, so if we go now, I would like to talk something that mm -hmm. Uh, an approach that we have here in, in Makai when we talk about uh, our project from the Google Data Commons. Uh, and it was very exciting for us to talk about data because uh, this challenge is to take something that it actually is taught a lot, uh, like the data and the open data. Mainly for governments, we see today uh, a barometer, uh, even with the global uh, open data barometer where it actually um, followed the, the improvement of governments using data. Uh, this, um, this information is actually very uh, followed and, uh, for the governments, but not for civil society. So whenever we started to talk about uh, data for civil society, we faced our face challenge and it was like it was a lack of information for civil from civil society to talk about different um, approaches besides the government side. Um, Google Data Commons actually helped us uh, to understand the information that was already available uh, in some different um, sources, and it was very, I mean, it was very good for us to start. Uh, asking them, asking ourselves how we can tell a, a story that can be comprehensive for everyone. Because sometimes um, data is not democratized because of the comprehension of it, it's just made for experts. Sometimes uh, we see and we need even in our uh, teams, people that is uh, expert in data analyst or an expert in some of the topics that we want to talk. But as you know, and I think this is a, a problem that all civil society organizations face, which is uh, the lack of um, people, you know, like team that could work or could even participate as an expert in these uh, in this kind of projects. Um, so we start talking about something that could be related for everyone not just in Colombia, but also in Latin America that is talking about economic and economical growth. This is something that sometimes can be uh, very hard to understand for civil society because the root grass organizations, they are, you know, like mainly working day by day in the small projects and the small things in the territory. But how we can use, for example, the good and big data of economic growth to show them 
that actually civil organiza uh, civil society organization are um, adding to this economical growth. Uh, and I think that sometimes uh, we have uh, we haven't shown we haven't uh, you know like search uh, for this information because sometimes they uh, they don't acknowledge how to use the data but also they don't know how to share this data. And as we know and we see uh, as a part of the civil organization, we also have this responsibility to talk about the examples that we have uh, out there from uh, organizations like CEMEFI or like the Nigerian NGOs or Makaya to talk about uh, this importance and show the civil society the importance of the data that they have. Because sometimes, uh, and, I, and I know this happens in a lot of countries not just in Colombia or Latin America, uh, governments had uh, a very weak arm to take uh, to get into the territory and the civil and the organizations that were there are actually that they have this um you know like familiarity with the territory and the community and they can get this information that sometimes is hard for governments to take are also um some of the communities uh or uh, or 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 territories that are not formalized. So the government actually then doesn't count on them because they are not in inside the uh, political or the territorial organization of the country or the city. So we have a very strong opportunity there that can show bo both things. First of all, how it how it's important for civil society to acknowledge that they have a good source of power and data that can be used for other uh, organizations and even the government to take a, a better a action or decisions to public policy, and also could take us um, could could take a, a, a little bit of a, a good challenge for civil society and it is to understand that the data that they collect can be also be talked in a very friendly story, that stories can be made out of data and this data can tell strong uh, stories for everybody. In the example that we are showing right now here for the data commons in the text of in Colombia, we uh, started actually to um, think about the data that we have available in the data commons so we can talk and to this cross-reference source uh, to see what a story we could tell that actually help us to uh, to show that this is possible. You know that data can be uh, easily shown, speak, or understood. Um, so we started talking about an economic growth because apparently it is something that everybody sees as an important thing in a country because of the. Uh, investing or market or because of the economical growth of the region. And we started to cross this data and also be related with, for example, an exciting thing that we see that it is not actually shown when we are talking about economical growth. Of course, when we are talking about economical growth, we see uh, things about line of uh, poverty line or education or um, going into uh, education or a uh, birth or uh, other or employment, for example. But um, we also started watching that something that's, uh, if you could go into the second chapter right there, the story blocks, we could see, uh, we could see that actually homicides were also a variable that is not very tough um a lot when you are talking about the economical growth because apparently there are two variables that <laughs> things separated because security uh is not actually talked together with economical growth but we also saw a connection there that as as colombia has improved their economical growth also in security and the number of homicides uh in colombia during the last year has dropped as the uh, SG, um, as the GDP group, growth. So this is very exciting for us because it it actually 
um, support our theory of talking uh, stories that are not, you know, like in the surface, but we also could talk about the stories that were uh, grounded in the data. But with these, for example, um, different different forms of view, like you can graft and you can also check and cross-reference different variables, uh, we could also see uh, this good um, information and allowed us also to have a, uh, a little bit of hope that going and according to the economical growth in Colombia, we are making uh, we're making it more secure and we also are making uh, civil society more empowered of their uh, informations to show that uh, not just um, the information that are available from the government, it is important, but also what uh, other initiatives from Colombia and from another countries uh, we can use as an example uh, to, you know, enhance and contribute to the data commons and the use of open data in general. That's great, thank you. I, uh, and again, we'll have plenty of time for questions later, but just um, quickly, one of the things that you saw as we were going through that is the context around the data. You, you know, the story that, that you were telling us, Ingrid, is you're able to put on the page, right, and illustrate with charts, but getting to that spot where you've been able to curate the data that helps tell you the story requires the ability to investigate those data. You know, and, and I think the point you made about being able to look at data that is not normally shown together, you know, is a huge part of what this tool has helped us do, right? Because otherwise you would have had to found, you would have had to have thought of finding both of those data sets, find them, and then, and then get them into a format to, to just even ask the question, right? And I think th that's what it's pushing us towards so that we can then take that insight that there's a correlation between lowering homicides and increased GDP and say, well, does that play out in the region? Does it play out in other countries? You, you know, can we look at homicide as a, a lowering homicide as a leading indicator of an improved GDP, right? And, and what might that mean to civil society organizations working in violence prevention in their communities? you know, to be able to tell their story about why their work is important. Their work is important to keep people safe and secure, but but maybe this, at this other attachment to the economic security uh, of their region is something we don't talk about enough. And so I think the ability to get to that story is, is key. And then to test it and see somebody listening to that can say, I can say, does that play out where I live in California and, and, and go in and look to see if the same data is available to me, right? It makes it easy for me to take your lesson and apply it to a different community um, and, and see if it holds true or not. And I think that's a, that, that, that's a, a great part of the insight that comes from this and what this exploration starts us on. So, so that's great. So, so the, the last two stories we saw were um, built on data commons itself, right? It was using the visualizations that are in data commons to be able to show and tell these stories. It was using data that's already inside of data commons. And it creates these topic pages that allow us to provide some context as both of these pages did um, around a set of visualizations. But there's also an opportunity to use the data that's in data commons in more visually sophisticated ways, connecting via the API and tell a more visually rich story. And, and with Romina and, and Julio, that's that's what we're gonna dive into now. Well, thank you, Manny and team, uh, TechSoup team for letting us be part of this experience and working um, in this new way of looking of and, and looking and, and use data, no? I think that uh, data has been a very important um, in some sectors for decision-making uh, for some long time ago. Uh, but in the social sector, I think that we haven't used it as much as we could. Maybe because uh, it's not easy uh, to understand it because traditionally we are more used to qualitative information. So in our experience, this was a new level of understanding data. Um, first of all, I would say like choosing a sustainable uh, development goal, 
uh, it was complicated, especially since SEMEFI does not directly address any of these issues, but um, rather to support the organizations that are actually working on the field. Uh, so the commitment of, uh, of working on, it, on, a, on an SDG became a process of internal debate. All of them are important. They are a common floor of facing problems. Um, so finally, we, we choose zero hunger. And then I, I will say that is to understand the dimensions that the concept of hunger is related. Um, for example, it could be approached from the perspective of nutrition or quality food or undernutrition or for insecurity. So it has like many, many ways to understand uh, what do that means. And, and that made us like aware of the complexity of the hunger issue. Um, then I will say that another important thing that we have to, in, in the way of, of making this story was the availability of the information. Um, to tell a story, you basically need to have data disaggregation to understand and, and to put on perspective the problem because sometimes just like national data is just not, um, like if you take the average of the country, for example, it's not as much as useful or, 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 or the best way to connect with the problem. So we explore different sources of information. Uh, at, at the national level and some were not comparable. So that was when we had to take, for example, the decision of how to manage different sources uh, to start looking for, 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 for the data, no? So uh, food insecurity, for example, we, we try, before we arrive to hunger and gender in Mexico, we, we try so many uh, hypotheses that we were thinking, for example, like, the difference between men, uh, food insecurity in men and women, for example, food insecurity in women in, in rural and urban areas, for example, food insecurity among people who faces disabilities or indigenous people or communities. So um, by the end, I mean, even if all these data uh, that we were like uh, trying to understand and to interpret it were alarmating, uh, we think that it was not fully uh, reflecting the impact that we consider necessary to get a, a deep reflection of these issues. Um, and I remember that, that by the time we were participating in a forum of, on, on access to water, and it was argued, for example, that the issue, uh, uh, that an issue that contributed to domestic violence was the lack of, of water. So that gave us like an idea of exploring the relationship between food insecurity and domestic uh, violence. And um, we, uh, we start looking for this possible relationship um, uh, because they, there were different sources who are actually one looking for food insecurity and the other for domestic violence in women. So we start looking also for academic articles and, and, and all of them address that this connection uh, was, but in a more qualitative manner than really thinking about data. So we began just like uh, the task of cross-checking data to verify the relationship with these issues. And as Ingrid was saying, there was just two different problems that we just trying to put them together and trying to think what was behind that. And uh, we observed that, and, and maybe you can uh, jump into chapter two. Um, is it possible? The story? Yeah, because I think that that's where, where actually you can see more about the, the, the information in chapter two. Uh, because in chapter two, for example, we, we really uh, started to understand or to observe that in many states of the country, uh, the data of hunger and the data of domestic violence uh, hinted like a, a, a direct relationship. Um, so for example, then you have there the information about the state. So when you actually click there in some states, you can actually see how do they are moving and in some states when violence was decreasing then hunger was decreasing and so on it really depends on the state that you were actually looking uh, so that was something interesting now how do they were moving um, these two variables um, directly 
in some states were more clear than in the others, but it was the thing. Then um, after we see all of this, we subsequently look uh, uh, to organizations that were focused directly on the problems of food insecurity and violence. And I mean, talking to them, there was just like a, a, a whole learning process about their work experience. Uh, this exercise was really, really important for us uh, because even though the data was already suggesting a relationship between uh, these two uh, problems, the people that actually was working in these organizations confirm us that in practice, this uh, food insecurity in women uh, was very uh, common to manifest, to, to be uh, part of this violence uh, uh, that they were facing like violence. So it was it was interesting also to have that. And uh, talking to them, we also realized that uh, violence and food insecurity were not the only cause, that were not the only problems that were related, for example, such as uh, lack of education, home care, uh, informal work, poverty, and like so many issues that we were not able to put it on this story, we're just like, a whole thing, uh, a whole panorama they're working, uh, you know, on, on the work of the organizations. So I will say that for this reason, in this story, we really wanted to make uh, more visible the work that the organizations are doing that because based on their experience, they have designed uh, integral solutions in their models of attention that allows them to, to not only attack one problem, but also to set a conditions that lead um, to more visible uh, effects on food insecurity. Um, we also realize uh, with exploring all these uh, different sources of information and data that uh, NG, uh, the, 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 the information of NGOs were not uh, really include in, 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 any, in any place. So it was something that it was inside of organizations. As, and as Ingrid says, I think that data commons will uh, help us to get uh, more data for the people who is actually working on the field and who's actually uh, producing evidence of how the problems are being faced and how the problems are being um, doing with that. So that was uh, something absolutely important for us. And uh, even though the chapter one was just more about like playing a steel, uh, like, a, like, a, like a base of what is the problem, then on the next chapters, we were just able to explore or to give more elements to the story to make a, a storytelling, uh, trying to make more connection with the, with the people. So that was basically like like the story behind this uh, this story. Of course, we will talk maybe later about some other issues that uh, we were facing um, on, on getting this uh, in, in this view, but also like to like to understand how that works to say or to tell a story. That's great. Thank you. And we're starting. I think the the that we're starting to get a few questions coming in, so please um, please feel free to drop them either in the Q and A section or or right into the chat, whatever you prefer. Um, you, you know, just before we jump in to the the more general questions, um, Romina and Julio, I, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about more about how you think organizations can use data. And, and build up the sources. I mean, what's so so that so that they're you know getting at what they care about with their causes. One of the things that was you know OEBC talked a lot about the political part of data, right, and the necessity to be able to interrogate the data source and determine if you trust it, and to identify places where there may be political reasons that data isn't being shared or or shared at a certain level of granularity. You, you also talked about when you were just talking about validating the data with community organizations so that they're helping provide even a more hyperlocal context, you, you know, and talking about the differences you saw in correlations in this data at the state level. 
right? And and so I, I wonder if you can you you two can talk a little bit about how you see organizations being able to plug into this and use this kind of data assets to achieve some of their own goals. Yeah, right. Well, I maybe I'm going to 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 talk up a little bit about our experience. Um, the thing is that traditionally uh, from from our team, we were used to create narrative from the data. Uh, and pro to for this experience, uh, we took a reverse approach, first identifying the story we want to tell and then support it, support it with the, the data. So, uh, well, Trying to answering the the, um, the question you are making us now, I think that uh, we we still have a long way to go in in order to make NGOs, um, let's say that they can work with data, but not only for making decisions, but to tell on quite good stories in order to communicate effectively their their causes to the public so i think that um well how organizations can, can use the data to build stories and strengthen their causes is can be summarized in in this this phrase is not the same thing to have the data that to know how to tell them I, I, we have seen many organizations that gathers a lot of data public data and inside data related to issues that they address. However, they are not necessarily useful when they want to, to communicate their work and especially when they want to invite other people to be aware of their causes and, and to invite them to work in order to create a, a better situation for the, 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 the population. So one, one, one challenge I think NGOs have is that the nonprofit sector, at least in Mexico, has only recently begun to develop this culture of working with data. And there is a lot of public data, but it is not necessarily connected, nor is the knowledge to explode it properly. So we believe that platforms like, like this one, like Data Commons, are going to play a key role in giving, giving people more access to direct data to visualize it and also i think that at least with with us in, in our experience working with TechSoup does a great job for us in adding experience and they help us a lot to to, to connect with this project and to discover how do we want to tell the, the story how to use the data to tell a good a good story that and at the end of the of the day, I think that this kind of help from a partner that teaches us how to tell and to stretch a story give us the capacity to generate impactful narratives, and it also uh, well allows us to to get involved in this culture of, of data in a better way. I think so. That's in in my opinion. I, I think this is how organizations can use data. And we, at the end, we need to learn how to to not only use them, but how to tell it uh, to the world to cause this positive impact. Yeah, what when you one of the um one of the other things that I just wanted to ask about is as you were going through the process of deciding what you wanted to explore, the process you you described early on, Romina of picking an issue area and then saying, okay, how is it that we want to be able to look at this data? What are we looking at it, you know, in combination with? You found data sets that were not in data commons that, that you chose to use and are on there. And I wonder if you can just talk a little bit about what made you say, actually, and that's part of the reason we told the story in this format, right? Because it allowed us to pull in some non-data commons data sets. Um, and I wonder if you can talk just a little bit about what caused you to pull in that additional data set or what you saw as limiting in some way with the data that was in data commons. Yeah, we, we when we jump, like, I don't know, it was just like, I, I guess we started this program, this, uh, 
this uh, uh, thing in, in, in May, um, or May, yeah, I think it was May. And from May to now, data, change, data commons have changed a lot. It's just, it, it, it is right now more accessible. I, I think it's, it's easier to go in, but when we jump into the first time and we start looking uh, for a specific SDG, which was um, food insecurity and women in women, uh, then we start looking that all of the information was at the national leverage. And as, as we talk, um, sometimes the national leverage is just doesn't really focus on the, on the population or on the issues that you want to address. So it was very important for us to, to get a little bit more of what was going uh, on every state, for example, on, on, another, on another group that we were trying to focus on. So I think that uh, another thing is that uh, Mexico, you know, we were more actually um, uh, familiarity with, with, with the information that is in Mexico, produced in Mexico. So I think that, for example, in Data Commons, something that, that is missing, at least in Mexico, from the information in, Mex in Mexico for, the, uh, for, for, for hunger, it was just that the information was not, uh, not necessarily complete for what we wanted to, to tell. Then, for example, when we saw the rest of the stories of Nigeria and Colombia, it was very interesting how do they manage to, to build a different story with, with, the, with the information that was available there. But I think that uh, in that moment, when we jump into the story and we try to really focus on more uh, a state level, uh, the information was not ready um, there. But the important thing that was that we were able also to contribute to put data on, 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 on data commons so it can be used for you know different organizations or different people who are were actually trying to look for a more specific ways of, of, of these two problems, domestic violence and hunger. I will say yeah. that. Yeah, I and and I know that part of the the goal of of this grant work is to identify data sets. Um, that should and could be ingested in data commons. And by ingested, I mean normalized so that people can explore them using these tools. I mean, I th think the thing we saw is, is that there's always still a link back to the source of the data, right? Because the part of the goal is surfacing it so that community members can interrogate the data in all of the ways you all have described, whether it's about trusting the source or validating with local communities or understanding how it may be differentiated. And we see different trends in different places and then get the insights from community members on why they believe that, that to be true. I think one of the, uh, uh, somebody in the comments said collaboration is, is key. And I think collaboration, Definitely. yeah, exactly, is, is very key to us understanding the insights. And I think the, the role we all have as capacity building organizations is not to say what is and is not true or necessarily why something is or is not happening, but it's to help surface the content so that you can have, so that people that are closer to the context can have the conversations that are necessary to say, what is our understanding of this and, and, and what do we want to do about it, right? Um, I think um, just diving into um, some of the questions that we've grabbed here. I, I mean, let, let me start with um, sort of talking a little bit about how you see, again, I wanna dive more into how you see civil society being able to use this data. And when, when, when we talk about it, when I talk about it, I usually talk about three ways of civil society organizations using the data. One is just so that they can understand it and they can compare their own data to it and they have a benchmark or a reference spot, right? The second place is to identify places where data is missing and saying, well, what might we do at a local or national level to be able to organize that data so that it can be included in these data sets, you know, how how do we make civil society? We, we saw in all those uh, demos, you know, the World Bank and the UN and, you know, how do we make civil society be as authoritative a source of data, you know, and what are the projects that we do about that? 
And then also using that data for advocacy, using that data as a way of having the maybe political conversations or the policy conversations that allow us to say, wh where, where does policy need to influence the, you, you know, provide an influence on that. And, and OUBC, that's something that you talk about quite a bit, right? Data as a tool in diplomacy and to be able to surface issues so that you can have hard conversations without necessarily being oppositional, right? And I, I wonder if you, you can talk about that a little bit and how you, how you see civil society using it in some of those kinds of ways. I think I think the data commons platform helps us to be able to balance confrontation with collaboration, um, meaning that when we see the pool of data that we have, and I'll give you an example, working with uh, Mike of TechSoup, we were looking at the data and we're saying to ourselves, what exactly is missing here? Okay, now that we've seen what is missing, what exactly is the data that we have at this time telling us? And how do we use this to begin to jumpstart conversations that can help us all as stakeholders to come to the table and start reasoning as to what progress needs to be made, what challenges would or are impacting on that progress, and how do we collectively come together and work to address all of this? So civil society, and the beauty of this platform is that you only need to be able to play with numbers and you know be grounded in the context of you know your your local community for instance when the data on fertility comes up you read it you look at it and say to yourself um what does this mean 10 years ago and what do, what might this mean for the future of education or what might this mean for the use of resources in the country in ways that are sustainable, then you go back to that data and interrogate some of those metrics that probably would give you the picture of what uh, you're trying to look at. Uh, so civil society organizations now have an authoritative source. Uh, so I'm imagining someone reading uh, the page uh, that we have developed from Nigeria and saying, what's your source? Then I can say, this is data that has been collectively pulled from uh, government data, from UN data, and you know we have all of that in the central pool, and we're just playing with it for us to get a sense of what progress looks like for the SDGs. Then that moves away from the conversation of that ah, this data cannot be trusted or this hasn't been scientifically proved because we've brought all of the methodologies of this world together into a poll that helps us to say, this is the authoritative source. And when you cross check this with other data, whether it is government administrative data or the UN administrative data, the margin of error might come to something like, you know, 1.2% or 2%, which is negligible. So that then means that civil society organizations can sit in the room using this data to tell stories like colleagues have done in Colombia, or bringing it back to interrogate what the picture and progress looks like. Then someone asks, how can nonprofit organizations, how can we use data commons to show the work of nonprofit organizations? When you look at the Nigerian page, at the end of that, we spotlighted some organizations working in those key areas that we have identified. And data commons also helps with that, where we are able to do an atlas of organizations working on those issues. So for instance, we've looked at education and we're saying this is the trajectory of education. Uh, we can say these are nonprofit resources that can help us address these challenges. And these are government resources that are also helping us to challenge at the end of the day, we're even able to track goal 17 of the SDGs, uh, which looks at partnerships and also looks at you know collaborations that have happened for the SDGs. Over to you, Matt. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's we did a very small um, sort of pilot for a pre, not even a pilot, just a very small example of what you're talking about in California, where we took predictive data about global warming, identified the areas of the U.S. state of California that were going to get hot in a way that made it hard to get jobs or, you know, have food security. And then we looked at the number of nonprofit organizations that could be offering pantry or other meal services to the community members and said, 
okay, in preparation for this future event, we're going to need to activate these organizations so that they're prepared to offer a service because we can reliably predict they're going to need to offer that service, you, you know, in, in, the, in the next five years. And I think, you know, that gets at some of what you were talking about, right? How do we identify the trajectory of something and say, these are the organizations that can influence that trajectory. How do we get the resources to them? You, you know, so so that we're helping influence that. And how do we use data as a way of having that conversation, right? This this thing that we're all looking at that's in front of us, you know, and we're we're talking about what the data means instead of whether or not we agree with each other. You, you know, and I, I that's so much of what I hear and what you describe in terms of using the data to be able to have these what could sometimes be harder conversations. Um you know, I think I think all all of you have also touched on the idea of, you know, inherently that that in some places at least, nonprofit organizations, civil society organizations may hold data about their community that that nobody else does. I think Ingrid, you talked about this most clearly, right? Because you're talking about a country post with with a peace process. You, you know, that that has territories and areas that have not received government services for, you know, the lifetime uh, of like a 50 year old citizen. <laughs> and um, and so, you know, what does it mean so that we can um, expand our understanding of Colombia and the needs of Colombia to include these territories that, you know, the government does not have data on and the and the role of civil society potentially in helping you know, collect and organize some of that data. And I, I wonder if you can talk about that a, a little bit more, right? How we make visible these communities that have been inside the border of Colombia, but outside of government services for so long. Yeah, I think you touched on a very important point there because um, I think sometimes data, uh, it is collected in the urban areas and the main cities or uh, through a quoted population, you actually receive that results from a certain part of the country and the population of that country. So whenever you start to, you know, going into these isolated territories and you start collecting data, you can also see a tendency there. You know, like you can start uh, showing up different uh, needs or different uh, point of views or different even services that they uh, actually would need. As uh, so, yeah, OGVC talked, um, it is important to find what is missing there. But if we are just searching through the data of the a part of the population, we may be, uh, you know, like ignoring a need that it is already uh, pleased uh, in this part of the population, but it's not necessarily uh, come to the the other part of the population. And of course, these isolated territories, uh, they have needs that maybe in the urban areas they don't have. Because for example, internet connection is something that we struggled a lot in our rural areas. And we started talking about collecting data with papers or with you know other things rather than technology. So what can we do to make this data come into the table and start taking, uh, you know, like big conversation and difficult conversations, even with those data that it isn't in the technological world. Um, so we have also this kind of uh, responsibility to take this data into the conversation uh, and trying to, you know, put uh, these organizations into the technological world and start then talking why it is important for them, because sometimes they uh, acknowledge, uh, you know, like having this data is important for them because they know the context of it and they try to do the best for the community. But whenever it comes to talk about what they do inside the community, outside the community, it is difficult for them to, you know, let them, the others know why they do what they do. Because sometimes when we are far away from territory, we, we try to know what they need because we have sort of a sense of mm. 
you know, if they are hungry, we need to make, uh, you know, like community, uh, you know, community lunches or community uh, uh, dining rooms or something like that. But maybe they will have a little bit of information that uh, is unknown for us that will, you know, support a different decision that it is, I don't know, um, obvious for us, but not for the people in the territory. So whenever we come with the data outside of the territory and start understanding their context in their ways, in their, you know, like way of living or uh, the point of view they have, uh, we can make, and um, we can start to make better decisions and start, you know, spreading widely our actions. Like for example, Makaya, uh, we work in the 20, 24 of the 36 departments that we, that had here in Colombia. But whenever we start working in a new department, uh, which is sort of a state, we'll say it in the United States, uh, we start, you know, like talking to locals uh, with with organization, with social, uh, civil society organization in the local area, just to understand what data they have that we don't to make, you know, improved our services for them. Not because we are working in Colombia and Colombia it is a country that everybody is the same. Actually, we are a very diverse country and we have many different territories uh, as well as uh, as Mexico and Latin America and of course Africa would have also inside their own countries like a small countries, <laughs> it helps. So this actually makes us improve our services as well. So I think there is the importance to acknowledge and also to empower and also to talk about these um, included and including data from territories outside the government side. I think that, um, you know, it's it's interesting because you've been, we have a question in here that's about how data commons helps your region. But what I've heard is all three of you, uh, all three groups have talked about, um, you know, how, how data commons, how civil society can use data commons, how data commons can can um, sort of amplify the work of civil society organizations, so that it's not actually data commons. It's actually civil society. Data be commons becomes an insight tool that civil society is using to accomplish their goals and, and find things. I mean, data commons, it's an important tool because it does make the data accessible to organizations that would never be able to afford to have a data engineer or a data scientist on staff, right? And I think, as I said at the beginning, the framework for publishing the data means that civil society organizations can be a contributor to the data conversation and not just a consumer of the data conversation. You, you know, it, it, but, but it's really the work that you're talking about is getting close to the organizations that understand the context of that data so that we have a way of validating our insights and then using that data to get a seat at the table, you, you know, so that we're able to share that that context with with other policymakers. I, I'm wondering, you know, as you look at the regions you all are are, are re sort of representing in some way, Latin America, Africa, you know, very broadly speaking. Um, the um, I just wonder, do you see a regional application of, of data commons? Like we've, we've gone into this <clears throat> sort of the, the more hyper-local, right? Getting close to the context so that we can validate our understanding, seeing the way that that context changes even within a country at a state-by-state -state level or within a country where we have territories that may not have been included um, you know, in that definition. But, but let's, let's go the other way for a minute and say, you know, just go through um, each of you, maybe maybe uh, Romina and, and Julio starting with you too, and, and just saying, do you see a regional application here? Well, a regional application, um, it's, I mean, obviously we face like some, uh, com uh, you know, like uh, problems in, in the region, no? I will say that. Uh, but also, for example, something that, I, maybe a lot of countries in Latin America, I mean, not only in Latin America, but in some of the countries are facing, for example, is data during a disaster, for example, no? So right now, for example, what we are looking, um, 
with some of the, for example, the Huracan right now in Guerrero, which is one of the poorest countries in the world, uh, not in the world, sorry, in Mexico, uh, it's that the, the, the information uh, of NGOs is getting absolutely basic. So I think that one approach could be in, in general, I mean, in, in some countries will be like um, getting, for example, uh, data commons in, uh, in, in getting or, or maybe helping organizations to improve their abilities, their, their, their capacities to put data uh, during emergencies, for example, that could be absolutely helpful because right now we are looking that there are a lot of organizations working on that problem, but we are missing data. We are missing, for example, who is doing where, who is helping with that, and maybe data commons could be like a place where actually that could help. And I'm talking mm -hmm. right now in Mexico, where I think that disaster, natural disasters could be something that all around the world is just happening. So it could be an, a, a way of, of, of making, for example, more easy for organizations to use and, and, and put data over there to then try to improve our, our actions into more effective way. I will say that, just jump into my head. That's great. H Julio, anything you want to add to that? Actually, I was I was about to say something like that. Uh, yeah, I think uh, data commons could could help a lot. Is the when we talk about regional data, the only in fact one of our challenges here working in this project was realizing that at least now Google, Google have only national data, but they have the the sensitive to accept that they could receive more data, uh, more focus on a specific geographical area. So if if Google, if data commons continue that way, I think, I, I don't know, no more than a year, maybe two, data commons could become a super, super, super tool that could help visualizing data even in, in, in real time, in maybe helping our NGOs in natural disasters, like, like Romina already said, this hurricane in Guerrero, maybe could be helpful like in issues like just OUBC told us about political issues, maybe could help us on what Ingrid just, just show us about violence, about, um, uh, well, at, at the end of the day, I think that, if Google continue having this sensitive to receive data from other sources that made that they didn't haven't mapped yet, yeah, data commons could become a greater tool to, to the NGOs to help working, to empower them in their projects and so many things. Uh, Ingrid, anything to add to that? Yeah, I would like to say that also, as as you were saying earlier, um, organizations they they don't have or sometimes they don't have this uh, expertise inside because social organizations they are not able to you know employ a data engineer or data data analyst or something like that, and I feel like. Uh, Google Data Commons in that way could help a lot to understand and manage data in a very easy way for people to understand it and play with it, you know, like maybe uh, getting around some tools, like easy ones that they could actually see their data being worldwide. Uh, it, it is also that's, that, that could, you know, empower these organizations to um, go more into this data thing because uh of course data and data analysis analysis and everything is going like very famous right now because mm -hmm. everything is start about data you know uh, like opinions are there but now data has a more powerful you know like force into the conversation worldwide so I think that when organizations see that they can actually manage data, understand data, and they could transfer this data to their beneficiaries or to their stakeholders in general, uh, they could be uh, capable to be empowered of the tool. Because mm -hmm. I think that more, to, o sea, more than they to see their data uh, on the website itself, 
is to play with it and see how useful is the mm -hmm. data that they put on there to the other people. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I think that that data commons in that way could actually democratize it very well because they have a very easy tool to share to 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 search uh, and cross uh, different variables that actually we we, we can relate in our heads because you know sometimes uh, hungry and uh, gender they couldn't be related, but with this this tool actually we could. Um, crossed and link it there. And they could also, uh, you know, uh, like um, contribute uh, to these insights because sometimes uh, great, uh, like the World Bank or the United Nations and everything, they are the only ones that actually get insights from the information because they have a lot of people working on it. But whenever a small organization could get an insight that we haven't seen because they have not just the data, but also the context of the territory, there will we have an, a, a more empowered civil society. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting because that's one of the places where I think lowering the bar to asking questions of the data, you, you, you know, that, that you were just talking about is something that it does well. On the other side, it lets you pluck out the answer. I mean, this is what I was saying. They They have something which we didn't demonstrate in this, that allows you to embed something. So if you imagine embedding a YouTube video onto a website, you can do that with a graph because then the organization can say, this is the piece I got the insight about and share it on their own website and provide context, right? For, 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 for that sharing. And I think that also that ability to pull it out and say, the context is what's important here. You know, I'm not gonna send you off to do the exploration on your own, you can you know, to validate what I said or to see if it applies to you. But I want to use this piece of it to tell my story. I think that's that, that that's a hugely valuable part. Um, OEBC, if you, you want to chime in on how you see this playing out, maybe at a regional and not just a, a national level? Yes, I mean, understanding that uh, national progress makes regional progress. Uh, that means that we can begin to use data on data commons to uh, peer review uh, governments across the region in ways that helps us to map best practices, but also helps us to show regional progress. Uh, for instance, what does progress look like in Africa? And what does, you know, what are the gaps that we're seeing? How do we move together as a region in ways that helps us to contribute to global uh, development as it were? So it's also a tool for peer pressuring governments, you using evidence, and also a tool for global diplomacy as it were. Uh, so the Latin America region bringing the dynamics, the African region bringing the dynamics, the American region bringing the dynamics. Then we all come together at the United Nations and say, this is what progress looks like in terms of the work that we have done as civil society organizations using pooled collective data. This is what the data is telling us. And this is where we're not making progress. This is where we have made progress. For countries that have made progress, what lessons can we learn from that? What compendium of best practices can we bring together in ways that helps others to compare the notes, but also puts more pressure on countries that have the same, about access to the same resources or that belongs to the same continent or the same region. This is another value add for, uh, for us when we make use of this platform here. Yeah. yeah, and I think also as we have an increasing number of existential issues that aren't defined by our country borders like climate change, you, you know, and migration that happens because of war or regime change or climate, <laughs> you, you, you know, and, and the ability to look at data, you know, people aren't, I mean, people aren't staying within their own borders <laughs> um, because they need to travel, right? To, and, and it helps us be able to um, talk about those kinds of issues as well, I think, with, with a voice that crosses national boundaries. Um, and I think that that also is a way to think about it, you know, at the regional level. I, I, I love this stacking that I've heard from you all of the hyper-local context. So we're validating, like, is this what you see? The ability to go to organizations and say, if you don't see yourself reflected in this data, let's talk about that, right? Is it because your data is not in here and then we're working on a data organization and collecting project? 
Is it because this data doesn't resonate with you? Well, let's let's interrogate, you know, the data source and uh, understand what that means. You know, at the national level, the ability to use this data to talk about hard problems and say, okay, we need policy to influence this. This can't just be the work of local organizations trying to lower homicide or, you know, increase food security or provide for education. We, we also need policy support so that we can get the real benefits of these activities. And we can see that correlation and the ability of the data to support those kind of conversations. And then for us to be able to talk about the issues that are not going to be contained by, by our national governments, because they, they are about things like climate change. Or, or because they they are about m migration due to natural disasters or, or war or regime change, you know what, whatever it, it may be, and and our ability to say okay how are we supporting the our fellow humans on this planet so that we can continue to be fellow humans on this planet, um and and have access to resources that allow us to thrive in our communities. Um, I just want to say thank you to all of you, um, not just for presenting today. Um, it was wonderful to be able to ask you questions and do a deep dive into your stories, but also for the commitment work that you do every day, um, you know, and that just the thoughtfulness that you, you bring to all of your work and that you bring to this project. So thank you for participating in the whole project. And, um, and to those of you that attended today, thank you very much. We'll be sending out a recording of the session. We're also going to write up uh, just a short article that does an overview of what we talked about and learned to make it easy for you all to share with colleagues or for us to share with other people that couldn't attend today. Um, we'll share this list of links. I know that we've been sharing it throughout in the in the chat as well. And then there were a few questions that I answered typing, we'll pull those out and share them broadly too for folks that, that miss them. Some of my answers were, great question, I don't know. Um, we'll, we'll talk to the Data Commons team and look at it and, and get a little bit more information. Um, but uh, with that, I think we're two minutes to time. So th thank you all very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, a pleasure to be here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.